So welcome everybody. Really excited to uh, to have this conversation. Pixie Labs is here with us today. Uh, you know, we've got three amazing individuals. Kelsey Hightower, who's an advisor to Pixie Labs. Kelsey has teamed with us on a couple companies uh, as an advisor, and we hope many more in the future. So welcome, Kelsey. Uh, Ishan Mukherjee, who uh, Ishan and I used to work together at Kiva Systems way back in the day before GV uh, and before Pixie, of course. We worked on three different GV companies together and are, are extremely excited about Pixie. And, and Zane, new to the portfolio, CEO of Pixie, really excited to have you. So uh, let's just jump right in. I think the world needs to know more about Pixie. Uh, curious, in your own words, you know, what is Pixie Labs and, and why does the world need Pixie Labs? So Pixie is an audit telemetry system for Kubernetes. Um, we're a system that allows developers to understand and debug distributed systems in production environments. So we basically do this by automatically instrumenting their applications and providing like a pretty seamless developer API experience. So why does the world need Pixie? Um, one of the things we realize is that infrastructure is uh, getting abstracted away and developers are building uh, more and more complex systems and applications are getting more interconnected than ever before. Uh, but the way we work with production systems is complex, slow, and honestly, as a developer, it's a little bit painful. So Pixie aims to provide a consumer grade experience to make it a joy for developers to work with and debug production applications. As, as Zen mentioned, uh, the, the core idea for Pixie is to save developers time, uh, both from getting visibility and, and once you have that, uh, using that visibility to kind of debug incidents or also ask general questions about your application performance. As Zen mentioned, Kind of that's been our North Star. And since starting the company kind of late 2018, um, we've been kind of aiming towards that goal. And we launched our beta in May of this year and have seen really exciting validation from our early access customers. So as of today, as we come out of Stealth, um, developers brought from early stage companies to folks who run large scale uh, kind of production systems are seeing the early promise of this kind of vision that's kind of Zen shared, which is giving developers access to data automatically so that they can get visibility and debug these incidents in minutes instead of like hours and weeks. What does that mean for the customer? So we understand that, that uh, you know, people are excited about having this auto telemetry. What is a customer's uh, experience with engaging you and starting to see the product firsthand? Yeah, absolutely. So in kind of industry speak, the idea is to get automatic golden signals instead of spending three, six, nine months convincing all engineering teams to refactor their code base to add instrumentation libraries in. So this idea of having a couple of people in the platform team install Pixie, every cluster and node gets Pixie, and every developer is now enabled with these pre-configured views has been the primary driver. Talking about kind of mid to long term, once we have this blanket observability, we're working on technologies which allows developers specifically. So we would like to reiterate that we focus a lot on the developer persona because the idea is to make them self-sufficient, right? So, um, so in the midterm, what we want to do is give developers tools to get deep visibility into kind of application performance all the way down to the code. Uh, that's the midterm. I think the long term, as Kel Kelsey is going super excited and kind of Zen is going to share more we are building a Kubernetes native system. So we want to have developers forget about the fact that there is Pixie. Like this thing lives inside Kubernetes, it's running in there. You can stop worrying about instrumentation and also managing and trucking all this data uh, to a cloud hosted system. So again, near term is just kind of time to value. One of the things that we think about when we think about making an investment, we spend a lot of time looking at the founders, understanding the teams that they've built in the past. And not only can they individually scale, but can they hire people at scale? One of the ways that we get to that is we talk to folks who have worked for the founders. How do you bridge that gap from somebody who doesn't know anything about the company to someone who's convinced that working with you will be a fantastic experience as the people that, that sort of have worked with you continue to report? When I met these two, uh, I think Dave maybe said, hey, there's a nice portfolio company we have. You should check them out. I'm sitting here like, oh, God, another infrastructure company. How many more do we need? <laughs> and uh, I remember, you know, talking with the team, you know, before the lockdown, was able to go out and meet them at the office. And I remember I was giving them some feedback. And you always wonder, are they listening? And I remember we would follow up in a week 
and they're like, all right, we're going to demo you the thing you talked about. Here's how it works. And here's what we think about it. So it's over here working now. And the website has changed. The docs are changed. The code is written. Things are shipped. And he's like, this, everything you mentioned, but the key thing is, can you continuously execute? When that feedback loop is established, can you execute? From our perspective, there's one binary thing that separates folks who are a great fit uh, versus who um, who might not be the right fit at this point. Uh, and that gets to what Kelsey was talking about, this idea of being passionate about building. Um, if you look at Zen and ourselves on the team, uh, what we feel like is the true value is kind of shipping product. And there's a binary separation when we talk to folks where there are people, few people who really are excited about this grounds to kind of ground up kind of zero to one building, and that's where we've been able to attract really, really good talent. Over time, though, like as uh, as the company matures, I think the success of the product and the customer feedback are the primary signals which attract people into like the story that we're building. Zen, do you want to add to that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I completely agree with with what Ishan just said. Like. Basically, I think when we started recruiting people, we quickly realized that, oh, there's actually this, this separation, right? Like there are people who like building products from, from the zero to one, as you might say, like new things are, are very different. Like you've got to constantly get feedback from people, constantly iterate, and then, and then build something new. Um, and I think part of the reason we've been able to assemble such an amazing team is because we've been able to articulate both the story of Pixie, where we are headed, and you know, there's this opportunity to actually build something new from the ground up. We at GB have a pool of product managers across our portfolio and even in companies that aren't portfolio companies that we're constantly uh, engaging to help us understand where the future of enterprise software is going. What tools are they using that they're excited about? Um, where do they see the future evolving? You guys were those people before you started this company. You were, you were part of that cohort of folks. Kelsey is, is part of that cohort of folks. I'm curious, just from the three of you, um, you know, what does the engineer, the developer of the future look like? What's changing for developers right now? And what will be totally different over the next five years? I have a good story. I, I want to go I have a nice professional network of folks that are not technologists you know, by trade, like my dentists and the lawyer community and people who do education leadership. And we were at a dinner uh, recently and you know, practicing social distancing, of course. And the person left the law practice to create applications in various spaces they were interested in. I was like, well, tell me about the apps you're building. And he was like, well, I'm not a real developer. And I was like, well, let me not listen to that piece because maybe there's something interesting here. And he was like, I'm, I'm just using these no code platforms. I have an idea about how the business process is supposed to work. And one of the apps he was building was like for flight instructors there's not that many of them in the US that can actually ride along with you, but they have one major problem, which is keeping their schedules up to date. And there's really no software targeted at the small community. Well, he happens to be embedded in that community and he's just built a mobile app, writing no code, drag and drop, you know, <coughs> taking data, payments, scheduling, and just shipping a product for that niche community. So I think the future developer is going to look like when you go to restaurants, right? People will have their niche, they won't be focused on building a billion dollar business, but they will be able to build a sustainable business by leveraging these platforms that just encapsulate the best practice so they can just focus on the service they're trying to provide. So I think in the future, and some people are doing it today, you're gonna have more and more of these patterns ready to go. And we're gonna launch a whole new breed of developers who are developing directly for the in-state customer. Right. One one idea that I'm personally passionate about, and Zen and I talk a lot about this, is like our passion is to build kind of intelligent products or something that we call thinking machines. So when we think about the developers standpoint, like for me, developers are are creatives. And over time, as Kelsey says, like they'll be kind of creating these experience end to end as and kind of stop thinking about uh, things which are not core to the experience. So in that framing, kind of what we are passionate about, like I'm interested in Pixie for is this idea of kind of intelligent augmentation. Is it, could we build productivity tools which essentially augment developers' workflows where they focus on delivering experiences and where, where, where the tool chain is there to make them more productive. Monitoring, debugging, these data tools is a part of that kind of uh, larger framework. So kind of most of us who become developers, we think developers are creatives. 
and developers demand tools that like a designer has with Photoshop or Figma, like just kind of really building these high quality consumer grade kind of kind of augmentation workflows is, is kind of what, what's super exciting for me. Can I add a little bit of context to my previous statement? Um, if you think about what happened in the mobile space, iOS and Android, a lot of the things are already there as part of those base platforms. So when you sign up for a developer account, you get all those things for free. What we're watching is this unfold on the server side. We have Kubernetes, we have Prometheus, we have all of these things, but it's not cohesive and it's not automatic. So when I think when people touch Pixie for the first time and you just slide it in there and you see what you get essentially for free, it will probably make you feel like what the mobile developers experience, which is I know what to expect from this platform. The platforms we talk about today are just kind of piecemeal, right? Like they have some of the things you need and then you got to go figure out the other parts of it. So I think this is the next step in this evolution is saying, when I say platform, it needs to come with these additional things and observability is gonna be a, definitely a thing people will come to expect, but don't have today. I'm curious to know what gets replaced by Pixie's success? What is, what is the alternative reality that doesn't happen as a result of Pixie becoming massively successful? And of course, that's what Benchmark and we are, are betting on here. The number one tool that Pixie will replace is the nothing tool. Most people actually have nothing, right? So I think the thing you're going to be competing against is that most people are just straight up flying blind. Hope maybe is the tool. Like people are like hoping that nothing happens because they don't have a tool if it did. So then the next layer is if you do already have a tool, there are going to be some things that are complementary, right? So for example, when you look at Pixie platform for the out of the box, you may start to say, oh, this competes with Prometheus. Oh, this competes with Datadog or New Relic. But that would be short-sighted. To me, those are a lot of table stakes things that people are after, which is I have a lot of data that's being produced in the form of metrics. I'm going to go graph those metrics and visualize it, right? That's going to be a lot of what people look at as a baseline. But if you actually understand Pixie, I actually saw what we call Pixie scripts for the first time. And when you think about Pixie scripts, like if you've ever been a system administrator and you log into a Linux server for the first time, you start running these commands like ls, show you what's in the directory. And then you start to get a little bit more advanced and you do PS and you can see what's running on the server. And then you can see how much memory that thing is taking on the server. And you can see what part of your file system is full. That's what we mean by observability. But the only reason why it works is because you actually have tools that are workflow driven. I care about storage, so I run the DF command. And it can harvest all of the things that your hard drive is producing, the kernel's producing, and give you the next step, which is delete some files. So when you look at Pixie, you don't get the full power of Pixie until you start interacting with these Pixie scripts, right? So imagine having 100 Kubernetes clusters running God knows what, and then be able to run one command to say, this is the container across all of those clusters that's using the most memory, because now you have the next step in your workflow, which is to go take care of that container. That's the biggest difference that I think people are going to find. And I don't think there's anything in the market that will push people towards, we need to start thinking about a world where things are federated, data-driven, and I think it's going to remind a lot of people of that experience that they had when they logged into an operating system for the first time and ran their first set of commands. Absolutely. I think part of the reason we went down the path of building this you know, scripting system is that you know, we kind of embrace the, the Unix philosophy, right? We want to have like simple debug utilities, and this is something that actually you pointed out the, the first time I think we met where basically you really want to have like these really small self-contained utilities which help you figure out what's going on with, with a particular service or container. And then you can chain these utilities to actually build more of a data pipeline that can actually be used to control parts of your systems like load balancers, resources, and, and things like that over time. But the core of it is actually just building small utilities to help you understand the system.